Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Don Walters welcoming you to another edition of the Staten Island Bowling Club. Today, June 23rd, it's a beautiful summer day outside, but all the action has taken place today inside Columbian Lanes. The newly renovated center is thriving with bowling activity, and we're here with our third stop of the year with our Staten Island Bowling Club. We've got four bowlers remaining in our finals. They're right now, they're in their semifinal game. And our championship match today is going to take place on lanes 9 and 10. We have a little bit of history that was made here today with our Staten Island Bowling Club. But I'm going to take a quick break. And when we come back, you're going to have my co-host, Bobby Simonelli. And he's going to be talking to that man that made some history with the Staten Island Bowling Club. Hi, I'm Bob Simonelli. I'm here in the Columbian Lyceum with my pal Rudy, who just finished in sixth place in the Staten Island Bowling Club. This is a record, Rudy. I mean, you're the oldest man ever to make it into sixth place, but, you know, when I look at you and I watch you bowl, I don't believe you're 82. I don't feel oh, at 82. I really don't believe you're 82, because you're bowling on synthetic lanes, synthetic approaches, and you got to be at least 60. Thanks a lot. I, I mean, appreciate that. Rudy is Rudy is one of a kind. Rudy's That's a right. senior bowler. I'm a pleasant too. And Rudy's been around the game for how many years? Sixty-five years on bowling. Sixty-five years. That's more decades than anybody that I know that's bowling today. And I guess you've seen it all, Rudy. You've seen I the should. pros when Carter. That's all of them. Joe Wilman. All, all of them. Andy Farragalli. Uh, Luke we had Campy. Luke Campy on the wrong that foot, wrong Lou. foot Lou. Then we had right. the younger bowlers like Mark Roth Mark coming up Roth. the ladder. Right. And today we have bowlers that their names just change every single week. And it's kind of hard to grasp just who is the best bowler today. I'll tell you, with the way the lines are now, it's very hard to see who the best bowler. If the bowler finds his line, he's in there. Just like I bowled O'Brien. I said to O'Brien, instead of bowling, I'll shoot your pool, I said. <laughs> he said, no, no. <laughs> O'Brien, I guess, is still in there. Oh, yeah. That's well, a good we'll match. Take, we'll take care good of him match. later, really, oh, because yeah. he's got no right to beat a young man like you. We <laughs> he, could have had the first telecast with you at 82. Maybe next year. Well, maybe, maybe next, next year. year. Who knows? Next year at the Columbia Lyceum. We'll see what happens when Rudy just took his hat off, and our camera is doing really good. And we also have Bob over here. Come over here, Bob. You're on the lanes today. Yeah. You watch this youngster bowl today, and what you think of him? Rudy hasn't changed. He, when he was 60 years old, he's bowling just as well over at Sunset Lanes. That's right. Sunset Lanes. <laughs> no, I've seen him straight. It's uh, Rudy. Rudy's he's Mr. Consistency out there. I I I hope. When I'm his age, I can do what he's doing now. I love it. I vote three times a week, and I enjoy it. Well, see, that's what we like to hear. We like that's to hear right. from our senior citizens, because a lot of people don't realize that the senior citizens are the foundation of the bowling game. That's right. Because it started with the seniors, and then it goes on to guys that are out there right now bowling, and then to the kids. And unfortunately today, we need more seniors to promote bowling. Because when they go home and they talk to their grandchildren and they tell them about this wonderful game of bowling, maybe we can get more kids off the streets and into the bowling centers. I got a senior bowling club. We bowl Tuesday and Thursday here. All year round, too. And it's really terrific. I enjoyed it very much. Rudy, now that they've seen you make the finals and being the first in the Staten Island Bowling Club, are they going to let you continue to bowl with them? I hope so. I hope so, too. We got one bowler that's 90 years old. Oh, we're getting up there today. We have just a great time here at the Columbia Lyceum, and we will be back with you shortly to bring you another interview with Donnie Walters. That's it. Okay, we are back here at Columbia Lyceum with our third stop for a Staten Island Bowling Club, and we've got the man that finished fifth place overall today, Larry Enea. Larry, come on board. Larry is one of the guys, he doesn't bowl in many tournaments, but when Larry does make an appearance with the Staten Island Bowling Club, he makes his presence felt. Now you had a, you, you qualified last weekend, you come over today and you got through the first round of qualifying, right. and you drew a very tough opponent in Tommy Lazaro. 
Now, yeah. the, the thing I noticed about that match is Tommy opened with the first four strikes, put you behind the eight ball from the get-go. Yeah, put me behind the eight ball, and then I threw a, uh, a ten-pin wrap, and just I threw it away. But, you know, I, I kept my head in it, and then, you know, he opened up, which left the door open for me. And then later on in the match, I threw another ten, which I missed. So, you know, it's the luck of the draw, and it wasn't with me today. Right. But, ahead, you know, sorry. that's okay. But, um... Hopefully next time around, you know, I'll make the 10 pins and I'll be up there balling in the final four. Well, see the importance of the spares, Larry, and you're learning as you progress in this great game. The spares will always keep you in the game. You cover the two spares, you got a chance, and it's all anybody wants, a chance in a 10th frame to win the game. Yeah. Making those two spares would afford you that opportunity. Tommy is the type of guy that's not going to beat himself. You got to beat yeah. Tommy. Tommy can learn from his mistakes, he can learn how to adjust to a strike on leaving a five pin. It's a very experienced ball. It's no sin to lose to Tommy Lazaro. Nah, he was a tough opponent. He yeah. bowled very well. Yeah. And, you know, hey, I enjoyed myself. I had fun. That's well, all it was good having you and your lovely wife, and uh, who was, I think, auditioning for a job with the video camera in the background. And Well, yeah, she, she wanted that for her birthday, so she got it. <laughs> I think she would have rather preferred a win today for you, but... Nah, she's happy with the fifth place. Very good. Larry, always a pleasure, my friend. Okay, um, we are down to four bowlers. We have Mike O'Brien going against house bowler Charlie Baldwin. And the winner of that match is going to take on the winner of the Lenny Riviere and Tommy Lazaro match. And that match is going to take place on 9 and 10. Now, are we done with you or are you coming back up here? Okay, come on up. Let's bring Bobby Capel back up. He's one of the mainstays with the bowling club. Bowls in every single tournament. Cash is in every single tournament. Well, I want to ask Larry. Larry and I both bowl at Victory Lanes on Wednesday nights. And how do you find a shot com here compared to Victory Lanes? Well, here I, I swing a little more than I do at Victory. Victory, I, I bowl with Jim Garrity and um, and John Carney, and and they both like keep me more to the to the right side of the lane. So, you know, they stay more on my game than I do over there. And over here, I I swing a lot more. When we were uh, uh, qualifying, uh, I threw an entirely different ball than I did at Victory Lanes. But I just want to say, Larry's one of the, one of the better bowlers here on the island. Uh, I have a lot of fun on uh, Wednesday nights. In fact, uh, anywhere I go, I have fun bowling. I mean, that's the name of the game. That is the name of the game. And uh, I just want to, you know, since I'm up here, guys, I didn't win it this time, but there's always next time. And uh, hello, Gino, Local 726, the brothers and the sisters, Joe Pantano, and uh, a good buddy of mine, uh, Jacks. Thank you. <laughs> and there certainly will be a next time for Bobby Kafel, and the next time will be the first two weeks in August at that very same Victory Lanes. And I should also tell all you good viewers while I have you that the Staten Island Bowling Club is the longest running sports show on Staten Island Community Television. We will be celebrating 10 years come February of 1997, and you're all invited out there to come on over to the Showplace Bowling Center in February of 1997 and help us celebrate that very commemorative date. That will be February of 1997. The Staten Island Bowling Club will be running, uh, having its 10-year anniversary. I should also say, so I don't forget later on, that next March at Colonial Lanes, We'll be celebrating our 20th anniversary for the Staten Island Singles Classic. And that, to me, is just an incredible thing. I cannot believe it's been 20 years. There will be a lot of dignitaries on hand for that event, a lot of politicians, a lot of bowlers, a lot of athletes. You two are also cordially invited to come on over to Colonial Lanes. We'll give you updates on that very prestigious event as we progress this year with our show. Now, now we're going to take a break, and we will come back. You're going to have Bobby Simonelli again, and he's going to give you... Simo's segment. Hi, this is Bob Simonelli. I'm back again with Bob Spallone, the manager of Colombian Lyceum. Bobby, we had a tournament here at your place, and the scores were pretty decent, and the lanes looked pretty sanctionable. In other words, the, the bowlers themselves were bowling very well. And I noticed that if they threw the ball out a little too far, the ball never reacted. Uh, you have a couple of bowlers left in the finals, and perhaps you can tell us something about one of them. Well, one of them is Charlie Ball, and he's uh, the mechanic that works down here. And he does a lot of practicing. Uh, 
He also, when you see him on the show, he throws the ball very, very well. Uh, he's behind the ball all the way, turns it a lot, and uh, the scores were good uh, the whole uh, qualifying, and it, it were pretty good uh, in the matches too. And uh, you're right, uh, when you make a mistake and don't come out of the ball correctly, the ball doesn't react there, and that's because there's units on the outside boards. Bobby, being we're here today, and uh, I have you, a longtime friend. I mean, I know you since you're eight years old when you bowled at Paradise Lanes, and I bowled with your dad. A lot of things have been happening on Staten Island as far as the bowling world goes. And one of the things that I would like to see back is the travel league. Is anyone making any plans for any type of a scratch travel league from center to center? Uh, no. Uh, in fact, it's a shame because we did have a traveling league on the island about four or five years ago, and then it just stopped. In fact, we had the women involved also. And the people that did bowl uh, really liked it, but uh, it just uh, was one of those things. It lasted for two years, and then it just stopped, and uh, nobody really pursued it after that. Well, I would like to see it come back, but I would like to see a grab bag type format. In other words, where the names would go into a grab bag and each center would take out names and these bowlers would represent that center in the match games. And uh, I think it would be quite interesting if it was done that way rather than having centers put up their own bowlers. Well, you know, something was said about that because there were some centers that uh, were, how can I say it, they were stacked with a lot of real good bowlers and some centers didn't have many good scratch bowlers. So it was kind of unbalanced. And that, that was mentioned to kind of have like a draft system. You, you know, like if you had six houses on the island, the top six names would go into a hat and each center would pick the top six bowlers and that would be their captain and then you would go on like that. The un the unfortunate part is is that the way bowlers are today, they just want to bowl in one center or for one center. They wouldn't want to bowl for the other centers. And that's unfortunate because then it would be a good thing for the game if, if the bowlers would do that. Well, I think we're, we're reaching a... Uh a plateau in bowling today where bowlers have to speak bowling and not in a negative form but rather in a positive form and we don't have enough of that we have an article in the Staten Island Advance by Joe Diamato and I'm getting a little tired of reading it that he has a 300 watch I mean I think this ridicules any bowler that bowls a 300 game I mean I think he should really go down to Texas or out to the Midwest and they don't have any 300 watches, and they have twice the amount of 300 games on their lanes. I think what's got to be done here is that more constructive, positive reporting has to be done about bowling centers in general. We have to promote the game of bowling in every facet available, and we're not doing that. And when I look around and I see centers empty at night, and believe me, there are many centers that are, and when I had that interview with Joe Diamato where he wrote where I said that bowling was on a decline, uh, he failed to mention in that report that all of the information that I gave him was actually out of the bowler's journal and digest for the whole year. And what happened was the following week, we uh, had a rebuttal by Rab Wilkinson and, uh, and Lawson I, I from that. country. Yes. And what I gave him was just information stating where we stood as bowlers. And I really think that bowlers ought to get together and stop being negative from one center to another center. And remember something, that the more you knock one center and you hurt that center and in, in, in rumors passing or anything else and bowlers are lost in this game, it hurts all of us in general. So there comes a time now for unity. And I would like to see the centers on Staten Island get together and form a coalition, get Cause Light or Bud to sponsor a great traveling league. Now, I'm a Staten Islander, and you're a Staten Islander, okay? And yet we read in the advance about who's got the most 800 series. I mean, I have five 800 series, and yet I'm not recognized on Staten Island. 
And I had well, the eight. I shot two, and I'm not even on the list right. when it goes on the advance. Right. So. And I had an 825 in a four-man league, which you bowled and Naughty Pine, and yet they would recognize maybe somebody in the singles. But that's all under the bridge. So now it's time to put all our waste behind us and try to get into a positive form. And I really believe that if the centers could get together and form some kind of coalition where we could get the young bowlers in, and the senior citizens are here. The senior citizens, I was talking to Rudy earlier, are our best asset to this bowling game because they can carry the message to the youth of the game. And we don't have enough. Here we are in the Knights of Columbus Bowling Center. Okay, the Knights of Columbus for decades have, have led bowlers through centers, not only here in the Columbian Lyceum, but Rainbow and Gil Hodges and Maple Lanes and all over the Brooklyn area and all over the Staten Island area, everyone knew that the Knights of Columbus had a bowling league. And here we are now where family values have gone down in our city and perhaps in the whole state, who knows, or the whole country. So it's time for us now to think of bowling as a family and to get together with all of the proprietors and you being on Staten Island, I wish I was on Staten Island, I owned a center on Staten Island, Perhaps you could be the one that could lead other centers into this era of togetherness because there is a lot of separatism in these centers, and yeah. it shouldn't be like yeah. that. that. That's the unfortunate part, and that's what I was just going to say. I don't think, I mean, it, it would be nice if it happened, but I don't think the centers would get together. See, that's the problem. I th everybody is, like, basically for themselves, and, and, and that's not good for the game because... The more every center does well, the game does well. If it's only, well, it's only good for my center, so I'm only going to worry about my center, and let the other centers, who cares if their business don't do well, and if they close up, that's bad for bowling. Definitely, like it, Sunset Lane's close. It, that, that, w that was very bad for bowling. It's a shame that Sunset uh, closed. Sunset has been open, was open for how many years? 30 years or 40 yeah. years? I, I don't I don't know exactly, but it's, it hurts the game every time a center closes. And if, if centers, if one center or two centers look to hurt other centers by whatever they do in the, to hurt those centers, especially I, I hear things that people try to steal leagues from centers. And, and that's, that's un unbelievable. It, it, it hurts the game of bowling. And it's unfortunate, but I don't think something positive would happen. I really don't. I, well, it's a shame, but like I said, I, I would be for it. I would try to do something for it, but the other centers that would have to go along with it. My, my, my advice to everyone that's out there that might be viewing this telecast, especially if you're a manager of a bowling center, is to let you take your hat off your head and put your head first and think, just think a minute. If one center is not doing well, perhaps that disease will finally reach your center and the next center and the next center. So positive thinking is a must. Tournament directors, I say this to you. When you put a date on a tournament, check with other centers. See if they have a date so one center doesn't get hurt by another. League organization is very important in centers. I believe that one center can help another center. If a center is filled up at the hour a league comes in, well, then direct that league to another center. Because as long as there are bowlers bowling, all of the centers will do well. As long as there are empty lanes in a center, that disease could spread to every center. So we reach a time now in 1996 coming into our 96-97 season where we must, must think positively. We must think positive about our neighbors and other centers, the other owners, the other managers. Bob Spallone has been in bowling since he's eight years old. He knows a lot about bowling. He knows a lot about organization. And if any of you are watching out there and would like to see some type of a travel league or any kind of a league, your league, for instance, can bowl one center and another center. There's no reason why you can't do that. And you seniors that are out there, if you can just 
pass the word on to those junior bowlers that they're better off in bowling. And the reason I say this is that bowling, believe me when I tell you this, is the cheapest of all of the sports in the metropolitan area. All right? If you're on a junior program and you're playing baseball, if you're not really friendly with that coach, your kid is not going to play in a many, as many innings as another child. In bowling, the kid will complete his whole game. It teaches leadership. It teaches team leadership. And it teaches something to that child where even the parent can't teach him at home. It teaches him sportsmanship. And this is very important. So bowlers, I would like you to think about this. And the next time you go out or you're with a friend, bring him into a bowling center. Introduce him to the game because he will like this game. And as Donnie Walter says, Bowling is great for everyone. Okay, we are back at Columbia Lanes with our third stop for our Staten Island Bowling Club. And we have with us our two combatants for our championship game. Both bowlers are looking for, for their first title with our 10-year running Staten Island Bowling Club. To my immediate left is Lenny Revere. Now, Lenny's highest finish with the Staten Island Bowling Club, I believe, took place at Hudson Bay Own Lanes when he finished fourth place overall. Right. Next to Lenny is another guy looking for his first title with the Staten Island Bowling Club, house bowler Charlie Baldwin. Now, the difference in handicap, Mr. Spallone, for a championship match is 30 pins that Lenny is going to be receiving from Charlie. Before I turn it over to Bobby Spallone, Lenny, I want to congratulate you. You've got at least a second place finish today. You're getting 30 pins from young Mr. Baldwin, big, strong Charlie Baldwin. What are you going to have to do to win today? Well, just going to have to get on the lanes and just do the best I can. Just make my shots nice and clean and don't worry about anything else. In other words, you want to keep your first ball in play, make mm -hmm. your spares. Right. My spares have a clean game, no problems. Okay. Now, Bobby is going to ask the same thing of Charlie. And I know Mr. Spallone, being an aggressive and assertive type bowler, I know exactly what he's going to say. Okay, Charlie. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, that I'm glad to see you up here. Uh, you, you bowled about four squads to finally make the cut. But uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, knowing that Lenny has to get 30 pins, what is your thinking coming out in the first few frames? Well, I like to throw, come out with a few strikes, put the pressure on a little bit, you know, stay focused, make good shots. That's exactly what I would do if I was in his situation. Try to come out of the gate early, not to put pressure to, to overcome the handicap in the first three frames. It's a 10-frame game, but not to put more pressure on yourself by, say, opening in one of those early frames, and then you're down 40 or 50 pins. So that's what I would do also, Don. Bobby, before I let you go, being a house manager here at Columbia, and you're doing a whale of a job at the renovation, the new paint job, the new, the new tile, the place looks absolutely beautiful. Very briefly, tell us about the characteristics of 9 and 10, our championship match. Okay, usually 9 and 10. Uh, 9 is a little tighter than lane 10, and you're probably going to see that in the, uh, in the final match. My, my personal experience on this pair is that lane nine, the, you're better off going down the boards. Lane 10, you can go right with the ball. You can open up that lane, because lane 10 has a little more back end than lane nine. OK, we're going to wish the best of luck to both our finalists. And we're going to remind all our viewers that one of these two young men will be advancing to our Champion of Champions tournament, which Bobby Spallone is a previous winner of that event. That event takes place in February at Colonial Lanes. And we also want to remind all you viewers for the second time today that February, Bobby Spallone, of 1997 at Showplace Bowling Center, the Staten Island Bowling Club will be celebrating its 10th anniversary year. And everybody is invited. It's the longest running show on Staten Island Cable. So all of you viewers are invited to come on over to Showplace. We'll give you updates as we proceed through our, our year this year. And also, March of next year, our Staten Island Singles Classic 
will be having a 20-year anniversary. And that, of course, for those of you viewers who do not know, will be taking place at Colonial Lanes. We moved that tournament from country to Colonial, and that's going to be our 20th anniversary year, and that's going to be the entire month of March at Colonial Lanes. Now, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to get it on. match with Charlie Baldwin on lane number nine. Bob, can you tell us something about this lane? Yeah, this lane is a little tight in lane 10, and uh, you have to go a little more direct on lane nine. I see you got a solid 10 pin, and a lot of bowlers don't understand what a solid 10 pin really means. It means exactly what it is, a solid 10, the ball not finishing. Six pin going around the 10. Seeing that he's switching balls, he just missed it to the right. Bob, this is something I don't understand. Here we are in Colombian Lyceum where you have the lanes pretty well the same all across the house. Why is it necessary for a bowler to switch bowling balls shooting at a spare when there's a lot of oil on the lanes? Uh, I can't understand that. I, I, I really can't because, first of all, uh, there's enough oil in the middle of the lane where you don't have to change balls. Because the there's ball also ball oil on the outside of the lane. Yes. But there's a lot of concentration in the middle of the lane. So you don't have to change balls. See, on the old conditions where we bowled, when you had a reverse block and the middles were hooking, then you had to change balls or you had to throw harder or, or make the ball go straighter with your hand release. But the way the conditions are today, when you have a lot of oil in the middle, you don't need to change balls. All you have to do is go to the left and just go right at the pin. You know, ironically, I'm watching Lenny Revere, and he's using a blue hammer on the synthetic lanes, and he's coming up on lane 9, which is a little tighter than 10. He struck on 10, he directs it up on 9, and just what you said, the ball never made it to the pocket. Right, he's going to have to move a little more right on that lane and go a little more direct. He hit in the oil on that shot. One, two, eight. A very difficult spare if he's coming up and the ball doesn't finish. Yeah, he has to make sure that the ball finishes to carry the back pin. Otherwise, he's going to leave it up to deflect. Well, we have a stroker on one end and we have a cranker on the other. And Charlie Baldwin, as Lenny Revere goes up the lane and he's got a problem. The ball fell off. Now, what we mean by that, bowlers, is that as he directed the ball up, it came into the oil, and being he's using a regular urethane ball, it's not going to have the same drive as a resin bowling ball. So he never really made that spare. He just took off the head pin. Charlie Ball went on lane 10. The lane that's hooking a little more, he goes out a little too far, and he leaves up a washout. Well, Bobby, before the game started, I said to you, I don't think you should be using this quake. I think you should be using the hammer because on that shot that he just made, the hammer would have came back. It would have finished. This ball goes a little too long. He also overplayed that lane. Like you said, 10 hooks a little more than 9. And he overplayed it, whereas 9, he was more direct. And he was looking for more hook at 10. But he started it into the heavy oil, and the ball never really finished. He's coming up on lane 9 now, a little bit tighter. Let's see if he makes a correction. Yeah, he, he definitely is playing the heavy oil. You know, that's because of the way he throws the ball. He, he has to play in the oil. But uh, I think he should make an equipment change. That time he went out for a... And he finished. Finish. That was a good strike. Donnie Walters, our statistician, can you give us a little bit of a scoring report? Well, right now, Bobby, after two frames, Lenny is leading Charlie Baldwin by 38 pins. And I, sh I should mention today to... First place is worth $500. Second place is worth $300. Okay, so we have a big match here between Lenny and Charlie going on 9 and 10 in Columbia Lyceum. Lenny looked like he never really got out of that ball, Donnie. He just came over the top, and the end result was the ball skidded down the lane. And believe me, he's very fortunate to leave up the 8 pin. It could have been a lot worse. Bobby, as I mentioned early on, both of these bowlers are looking for their first Staten Island Bowling Club titles. Um, the highest finish Lenny had has been fourth place, and this is Charlie's third trip to the finals, although his best finish has been sixth place. Lenny will be directing this ball up to the spare, and he made the spare. I thought that was going to slide right by. 
Oh, Bob Spawn said that 10 is hooking just a little bit more than 9. Let's see how he handles lane 9. The last shot on 10, he rushed the line a little bit. He did not get out of the thumb clean, and the end result was a full skidder down the lane. Time he was around seven eight, and it wasn't out far enough. And the end result is he's faced with another very difficult he spare. He he he's putting something on his thumb. I don't know quite what it is. Doesn't look like a, a rosin. Maybe it's a slide stick or something to get him out of the thumb a little cleaner. He's got the one two four eight. That looks pretty good. Well, how Charlie Baldwin, you know him very well, Bob. Is he a slow starter? Uh, not really. I think it could be just uh, it's his first time he's bowling for the title. He might be just a little nervous. That ball he threw really well. He got that ball out. Looks like the secret of the lanes is to get the ball to the right as far as you can and let the ball come up and finish as strong as it can, taking out the 10 pin. Charlie now on lane number nine, working on a double. Two strikes in a row. Goes down, snaps under the ball, and that time he did hit the oil, but he got away with it, Bob. But that's the way he releases the ball, Bob. He's got enough finish on the ball to get away with it in the oil. He threw the ball good that time, but he did he did definitely hit it in the oil. He didn't get it as right as he wanted to. Lenny's receiving 30 pins. He's up on lane 10. And after this shot, we'll go to Donnie Walters and get a st statistician report. Well, right now, Charlie Baldwin is trailing by four to, uh, 15 pins as we approach the middle stages of our game. That ball, uh, Bob, he, he looked like he just placed it. He, he, he really didn't throw the ball uh, aggressive. Well, once again, were these lanes used in the uh, qualifying matches? No, fresh set of lanes had not been used. Well, once again, we're on that fresh set with fresh oil. And the bowlers, no bowler has an edge on this kind of a condition because neither bowler had bowled on these lanes prior to this match. Lenny made a spare, and now he's up on lane number nine. Both times on nine, he hasn't reached the pocket yet. You look for a correction on this, Bob? Well, he's got to make a correction. But you know what it is, Bobby? Uh, sometimes when the ball is not hooking the ball, he hit that time. See what he did that time? He, he hit left of the second arrow. He's placing the ball. But that's what happens when a bowler sees his ball not hooking. They they start to like tighten up and they uh, instead of making the correct move and letting the ball do the work, they, they push the ball. Well, one thing we must remember: we are a handicap club. Uh, we are dealing mostly with handicap bowlers, and they learn things as they go along, as I'm sure Lenny will. Lenny converts the four pin, clean. And Charlie Bull were now coming up, working on a double, a triple. Probably a strike right here for Charlie. Puts him two pins down. So we do have a match, as you would say. Charlie looks like he's getting more and more confident as the match moves on. See that time he hit in the oil again, and the ball just didn't make it. What's if he would have made a... Uh, if he would have got that ball another two boards right, that ball would have been buried. Well, you can see definitely that the pressure is, is tolling here on these bowlers as Charlie, who did get the ball further right than on his last shot, all of a sudden pulled it in really tight on the last two shots as he converts the spare. Let's see if Charlie's going to trust this ball. We all know trust is a must in this game. Charlie is Charlie is trailing. Excuse me, Bobby. I'm sorry. Charlie is trailing by 13 pins. And the interesting thing on on Charlie Baldwin, if he watched him in his two previous matches, both matches he had the mark in the 10th frame to advance. So he's equal to the task. 
Okay, Charlie once again going on lane nine. This time he gets it out a little further than before, and he sweeps out that 10-pin with the power of the kickback. It's a perfect example of a good release and the resin balls when you send that message and it knocks out the 10 like that. Lenny now on lane 10. He goes right over that second arrow. And let me tell you, Lenny really got away with that because he hit 10, directing it up to the pocket, and the ball hit the head pin flushed, and that seven pin was the last pin to go down. Let's see now on lane nine if Lenny can take advantage of that strike on lane 10. It could be a very big strike. Lenny's still leading by 13 pins after seven frames. And both bowlers are looking for a double here. This is the tight lane. This is the lane that he's been having real big problems with. Lays it on 10. And that ball just fell off in the back end. And he was very lucky he got eight on that. He has the 5-8. He's got to be very careful on this pair because if he decides to play that oil, he could wind up taking that 5 right past the 8. Yeah, he's got it. Ooh. All right, now Charlie is down 13 pins. He's got a strike. He's a big frame. What is it? The 8th frame here. So we're getting right down to the nitty-gritty. See if he trusts that ball. Throw it to the right, Charlie. Nope, he went right over 10. And once again, we have another match here. Charlie winds up with a 5-7. Bobby, no matter what, he is pulling that ball inside of his target line. Yes. He, he, well, I, th I think he's, uh, he could be lined up a little more right also. Uh, but he's, he's stood definitely in the oil. The ball's skidding on him. It's not finishing. Got a good Got shot at down. this. Oh, just missed it. Bobby, he was standing in the same spot where he delivered the ball out past five and the ball come ripping back and he blew two racks. And yet, this time, standing on the same spot, he actually missed his target by almost seven to eight boards. Yeah, he, he definitely hit in the oil, hit around 12. But see, that's when, when it's a key situation, bowlers have a tendency. See, that time he, that time he trusted the ball and the ball finished. See, bowlers have a tendency when it's a real key shot to miss inside their mark. Charlie, Charlie just set himself up in a big, crucial ninth frame with that strike. Now it's up to Lenny coming up for the ninth and tenth final frame. Lenny is leading by 25 pins right now, so it's right there for him. It's right there for him. Still's not making no adjustment on lane 10. He's going to decide to go straight up 10 again. And he goes right over that 10 board. And this time he just buried it. Well, now he's finishing on lane uh, 9, which is giving him trouble the whole game. He's asked him. He's got to go more right with his feet and give that ball a chance to uh, work. He needs a mark. He needs a mark. Charlie Baldwin can go out to a 207, whereas Lenny marks here. He's got 212. And he's right up into that pocket, Bobby. And let me tell you something. There's no question about that. He went right into the oil. He fired the ball. The ball just stayed straight. And the end result was a win, a strike when he mostly needed it. And it looks like Lenny's our Staten Island Bowling Club champion at Colombian Lyceum. And this, as I said earlier, is Lenny's first title, and it's good to have him in a winner's circle because he's one of our most staunchest supporters, and I'm glad to see him get to the winner's circle. The amazing thing is he did it with a urethane blue rubber ball, not resin, playing the oil all through his match, and he did it again. So here we have a little controversy here. Donnie throwing the ball right, watching it hook back. Or staying in the oil and going straight. Well, they say straight is great. So I guess that's it worked. 
Let me tell you, he's got a lot of oil on that bowling ball because he's wiping it off with his towel. And I feel a little bad for Charlie because Charlie being a house bowler, knowing the lanes very well, just didn't come up to task. And uh, every time I've seen this young man bowl, he's always showed me that he threw a very good ball and a very strong ball. Now let's see. We're now in Charlie's 10 frame. Let's see if Charlie's going to trust the ball now. No, he hit it in the oil again, Bob. That ball just barely made the pocket. I, I just think he's not lined up. Uh, he could be about two more boards right with his feet, and then he would be getting out to the area. The ball would finish a lot stronger to the pocket. Could have also been a little over-anxious. Yeah, well, that's could be the you know the, he's still young I mean he's a little inexperienced it's his first time shooting for a title uh, he's got a he's got a good future in the game though Bobby he's, he throws the ball well. well I guess we'll be seeing a lot more of Charlie Baldwin as the Stan Allen Bowl, bowling club has more tournaments on its slate See, that, that's the ball I think you should have used in this match Sometimes when you're in a match, you don't really go to that second ball because you really think it's you all the time. And sometimes it could be just the way the lanes are oiled, that you have to move your body and move your line out to the area where the ball is going to react the best. And he never really did that. And I think that if he did it with even the ball he was using, as we've seen, that any time he threw the ball out past five, the ball just exploded on the way back. I think it was more of, like you said, his lineup being over anxious and perhaps a, a little bit nervous being on TV in the Col Columbia Lyceum. Plus these, these lanes are freshly oiled. They weren't used all day. They weren't used all day yesterday. So, uh, you know, the other lanes had the play on them and he was able to use that quake, but like I said, I think he should have used the other balls since they were freshly oiled and they were a little tighter. Let's go out and meet our champion and our runner-up. Let's do it, though. The latest stop at the Staten Island Bowling Club. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, at Columbian Lanes, and another Staten Island Bowling Club tournament has come to an end. Bobby Simonelli, this marks tournament number 132 in our career. And our latest runner-up here at Columbia Lanes is Mr. Charlie Baldwin, and I know that you have a question for him. Tony, before I ask Charlie any questions, I can still remember our first tournament, Naughty Pine. And uh, I remember the fellow that won it. He was broke. He needed money for a refrigerator. And to this day, I can never forget that one tournament. Out of all the tournaments we've ever completed, that's the one tournament that always stands in my mind as the first tournament. Here we are now, 100 tournaments later, and we're in the Columbia Lyceum along with Charlie Baldwin. And Charlie, I have to ask you this question. I mean, the bowling ball, the bowling ball that you were delivering had so much power. And every single time you delivered that ball out past the first arrow, it came back and it made the pins look like they were fake. And yet, as many times as you've done that, you've also released the ball inside the first arrow, and it got you into a lot of trouble. And I'd like to know why and how it happened to you, that you couldn't hit that first arrow more consistently. Uh, I have no idea. It just, just happened. Look at my mark and kept tugging the ball two times already. Twice already I tugged it. I knew as soon as I threw it. Can I ask you this question? At any point during the match with Lenny, did you get up and say, I'm going to get the ball to the right at any time? Yes, I did. I was talking to Tommy saying, like, get the ball to the right. And I'm like, no problem. I'll get to the right. And I tugged it again. Well, I'm about to tell you why it happens that you couldn't get the ball to the right. The next time you're in a match and you're missing to the left, slow down your approach a little bit. Give yourself a little time to think before you get to that foul line. Because it's a funny thing, when you're in bowling and you want to get a ball into a certain direction, you have to think about it, not back there, but when you're going into your slide. 
and this is what happened to you. You knew what you wanted to do when you got up to deliver the ball, but yet when you went to your slide, your body wouldn't allow you to do it. So everything happens in the sliding point. So the next time I see you in a final match, which is going to be soon, because the way you throw the ball, I would really like to see you just do a little different type of thinking. Tell yourself as you're coming down to get the ball to the right, and it'll go to the right, believe me. It'll automatically go right. Because when those, those couple of balls that you delivered, even Bobby Sloan said, they were like dynamite. Whereas Lenny now, Lenny was in further on the oil, and he was throwing the ball a lot straighter than that. So what happened was, as his ball went into the oil, it would skid up to the pocket, and it would lay back. And you were the opposite. You had to get your ball out and play the power part of the lane. And in reality, if you would have done that, I think we would have seen a lot more strikes from Charlie Baldwin. I guess you could call that synopsis the power of suggestion when it comes to what you got to do. But the next time he's bowling, I'm going to remind him. Okay. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> time on the yes. That's the key. Uh, you learn we'll something today. To yes. right. You learn something today from the best, from Bobby Simonelli. Okay, so make sure you apply the man. But Charlie, you bowled absolutely great. You really did. You really did. You both second. You, you worked hard all day. You had a lot of games under your belt because you had to qualify to get to our top eight today. So you worked hard, and you're going to reap the benefits. Tony, I want to say one more thing. Sometimes bowling in your own center puts a lot more pressure on a bowler than when they're out of the center because they, they're expected to do well. And this doesn't always happen. So that type of pressure is on all of our backs. We're in a match, and we're on our favorite pair of lanes, and our favorite center. It doesn't always come out the way we want it to come out. But again, congratulations to Charlie, your second place finish. And I know we're going to see you with victory in the first two weekends in August. Mm -hmm. And as for you, young man, it has been 10 years in coming for you. <laughs> 10 long years for you, because you joined us way back in 1987, the first year of our existence. That long? Absolutely. I had hair then. <laughs> okay, you didn't have this then, no, I didn't and you've been with us all this time, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the winner's circle. Thank you. Um, if persistency and if fortitude is worth anything, you've got all of that. You had it right there for you today. You went for it. You got it. You needed that mark in the 10th frame to shut Charlie out. You got up there. You threw the double, and here you are, our latest champion with the Staten Island Bowling Club. I'm not going to take the microphone this time. So. <laughs> um, what can I say? Yeah. Um, I'm glad that I shot the way I did. Uh, one thing, I was not nervous and I was not intimidated by anyone today, especially there's good bowlers here all the time. It was a terrific field. Absolutely. All the time. There's always good bowlers here. And I just come in for the fun of it. And maybe that's why I bowled pretty good today. Because I came in for the fun of it, not the competition wise. And. Uh, Bowling this uh, championship round, you know, I had to uh, make an adjustment, and I'm glad I did it early enough. And I hope to uh, bowl better again in more tournaments. Bobby, I know you got a question for Lenny. Lenny, you were using a blue hammer bowling ball, and you were going very direct into the pocket. At any time during the match, watching Charlie, the way he delivers the ball, did it ever put any fear of thought into your head? Oh, no. I wasn't looking at Charlie. Because if I did look at Charlie, and I'm going to be thinking, oh, he's going to get me. He's going to get me. And I don't know what to do. But I uh, took on myself to know what to do. Now, I've been bowling long enough to know, you know, to shoot in a house like this, especially synthetic lanes, which I, I kind of like more than wood. But I got a bowling bowl. Well, Lenny, we're very happy that you were one of our winners and that you are a Staten Island Bowling Club champion. You will re represent the Colombian Lyceum in our big tournament, the Tournament of Champions, and I can only congratulate you on staying in there and being the fighter that you are. Absolutely. And today you paid your dividends finally into the winner's circle, one of our original bowlers that joined us way back in 1987 when the Staten Island Bowling Club was formed. So it's great to have you in a winner's circle. We're really proud of you. You're both great. You're a true champion. And we look forward to you for the next tournament at Victory, first two weekends in August. And I want to remind everybody while I have you here,
about my weekly King of the Hill at Colonial Lanes. That's every single Monday night. That starts at 8 o'clock. That's at Colonial Lanes. And let's not forget the King of the Hill here at Columbian Lanes that takes place every single Friday night. And Bobby, we're going to ask you for our closing thoughts, my friend. All right, Donnie, I have a new one now because this is a name I'm going to mention a lot. I want everyone to listen to this now. Jackie Gleason on the Honeymooners. One of his favorite sports was bowling. So we all have a little bit of Jackie Gleason inside of us. All of you bowlers out there that have reached an age where we can't play baseball, can't play softball, can't play basketball anymore, we still have the wonderful world of bowling. And I would like to see each and every one of you introduce this great, great game to a friend of yours so we can have a lot of positive things happen in our game today. Thank you for watching the Staten Island Bowling Club. And remember, bowlers, to go bowling, it makes you feel like you'd like to.